There's a little boy who had a homework assignment, and this was one of the questions asked to him. Who is your hero? He replies, Dad. Then they ask, why is this person your hero? The little boy replied, he is brave. Then they asked, is there anything that your hero is afraid of? The little boy replied, Mom. All right. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the guys out there. We're so glad you're here. I do also want to take a moment to look at my father-in-law, Susanna's dad, and say thank you. Uh, great friend, mentor, and you've made me a better person, and I love you. Happy Father's Day to you. Yes, sir. Glad you're here as we're in this study of figuring out how to study the Bible. And we're doing this through the book of Philemon, this small one-chapter, 335-word book. And it's so important because many of us want to study the Bible. We just don't know how. We don't know where to start. We don't know what to do. Do I read the book of Second Hesitations? Uh, the book of First Opinions? Like, what is this? What do I do? I don't know where to go. But listen, it's so important to figure out how to study the Bible because there's a lot in there for you. Scripture says it this way. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. God's word has the answers, has the guidance, has the direction, has the wisdom, has the peace that you need. But we have to understand this point, that the Bible wasn't written about you. However, it is written to you. The Bible's not about you. It's always to you, but not about you. So what is the Bible about? Well, the main story of the Bible is God's love for the world and its redemption through Jesus Christ. That's the story. It's always about Jesus, but it's to you. And since the Bible is written to you, it is not wrong, it is not unwise to look at the Bible and see where you fit in the story, to ask God, hey, what do you want to speak to me? What do you want to show me in your story? So as we're going through the book of Philemon, there's three main characters, Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon. And as we look at these three characters, I want you to pray and reflect on which one relates to you. Maybe one of these characters in this season in this part of life, relates to you a little bit more. So the first one we'll look at is Paul. What do we see Paul doing? Paul is taking a risk on someone. Maybe right now, God is speaking to you just like Paul to take a risk on someone else. See, Paul is writing this letter to Philemon, and Philemon is a dear friend to Paul. Paul led Philemon to Christ many years ago, and now Philemon is doing well for himself. He's a leader in the church in Colossae, and Paul has a special connection with him. We see this in verse 7. How does Paul feel about Philemon? He says, your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. So he's proud of Philemon, he, he's proud of who he is and what he's doing, but now he's got a huge favor to ask. Welcome back, Onesimus. Onesimus, this runaway slave of Philemon who stole from him, made him look bad. And when Onesimus was running away, by the providence of God, he ran right into Paul. And Paul led Onesimus to Christ. And now we see this moment where he's saying, hey, I want to send him back. But I want you to know, just like you mean a lot to me, Philemon, Onesimus means a lot to me now. And we see that in verses 10 and 12. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my very own heart. Onesimus is like a son to him. Paul's our spiritual father, and he's so proud of the journey Onesimus has been on to restoration, to redemption. 
And you just kind of get the sense of, of the fatherly pride that Paul has for these two guys. And it makes me think of this story of the Phillies pitcher, Orion Kirkering, on his major league debut last September, and his dad, Todd, cheering him on. Check out this video. Orion hunting for his first big league strikeout. And he gets it as he fans Beatty with the slider, two down. Jersey Shore to Redding to Lehigh Valley to tonight in the big leagues for Ryan Kirker. 0-2 coming. And he struck him out with a slide. Kirkering begins his big league career with a 1-2-3 inning with a couple of strikeouts and dad couldn't be proud. Hey, maybe there is crying in baseball. Man, that guy was fighting back the ugly cry. You ever been there just fighting it back? Oh, he's so proud of his son. In an interview, he says, man, in that moment, he was just caught up, reminding himself of the thousands of hours of hard work his son put in, reminding himself that this has been a dream of his son since he was nine years old. The journey, four different minor league stops before this major league moment. He says, I just wanted to show up. I wanted to be there because I was so proud of my son. It's a powerful moment. Paul is navigating this difficult situation between two guys he really cares about and that he loves. Now, Paul could have easily said, you know what? I love them, but I don't want to get involved. I don't want to step out in this mess. This is their problem. It's not really mine. They're grown people. They can figure this out for themselves. I don't want to step out in this. I, I could just leave it alone, but that's not how Paul operates. Paul lived his life cheering on others and helping them succeed. Come on, may that be the call of our lives that we stand in the gap for others. We cheer them on for their success. May we as a church have a rally cry around this quote that my greatest accomplishment is someone else's. I'm just going to cheer them on. Come on, we all need people in our lives that have been there and done that and now can help cheer you on. Maybe God has placed someone in your life right now who needs you to believe in them. And you can stand up just like Paul Take that risk and be there for them. Now, fathers, father figures, I want you to know that your words carry more weight than you realize. So what does that mean? You need to be careful what you say. You need to be intentional in what you say. But by all means, say it. Be the encourager. Speak life into the situations. Uplift those around you. Take a risk and speak the words of truth. But Paul takes it a step further. We see this in verses 18 and 19. He says, hey, if Onesimus has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very own soul. <laughs> and you read that and you kind of see him do this a few times. Like, I'm not going to tell you you should forgive this guy, but you know you should. Like, he, this is rhetoric. He's not being sarcastic. This is ancient rhetoric, rhetoric to really emphasize a point, but it comes off real sassy to us right now. But this language is so important. This is like a promissory note. This is formal banking language, banking terms of a legal contract. For Paul to say, I'm putting this in my own handwriting, would be a legally binding agreement. He said, I will pay it back. This was the very first official IOU. All right, that there's good as money, sir. Those are IOUs, right? Dumb and dumber, anybody? Okay, you may want to hold on to those. So he's saying, hey, this is it. I'm taking a risk. What a risk he takes. Going all in, believing in Onesimus. You can charge it to me. You could put it on me. He's saying, I'll take the heat. 
I'll take the comments. I'll take the backlash. Put it on my tab. I'll pay for it. I'll show up. I'll speak up. He's with me and I got him. What a powerful moment of taking a risk on someone. Have you ever picked up the tab from someone else? I can remember a moment that I took a girl on a date in college, and I thought there could be some chemistry there, a connection, but on this date, man, the conversations were so hard. Every time I asked a question, it was just yes or no or the shortest answer possible. Then she was never asking questions about me. There was just one-sided dialogue. And I'm like, man, I have misread this completely. There's nothing here. And after a while, you start thinking, let's wrap this thing up. It's not going anywhere. Like, there's no connection here. And in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm just praying, like, no dessert. Please, no dessert. I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to stay here any longer than I have to. So I'm thinking when, when the waiter comes and asks, I'll lead the way. And I'll say, you know, no dessert for me. No, thank you. Did not work. Molten lava cake, please. Right? She wanted that dessert. And I knew the right thing to do. The expectation was set. I needed to pay for this meal. I didn't want to, but I felt like I had to. But when it comes to Jesus, he didn't have to, but he wanted to. We owed a debt we could not pay. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. Jesus said, put it on me. Put it on my tab. I will cover it. Anyone thankful for Jesus who put his love on the line for you? Jesus believes in us. He risked his very life for us. Paul risked everything for someone else. Maybe today in this season of life, Jesus is calling you to believe in someone in a radical way. Who do you need to take a risk on? Then we see our second main character in the story, and it is Onesimus. And this is for anyone who needs forgiveness. You are in need of forgiveness. Again, Onesimus, this slave who ran away, not only did he run away, he stole something more, most likely to fund his escape. And now he's a runaway thief. Now he's down and out. And if he is caught, Philemon would have every legal right to brand him with the letter F for fugitivist, which is where we get our word fugitive. Or he could be beaten, or law even said he could face death. This is serious. Maybe your need in need of forgiveness today. And I want you to know when you need forgiveness, when you need a clean slate, when you need a fresh start, when you need a second chance, Jesus gives it to you freely. 1 John 1.9 says, But if we confess our sins to him, to Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That's the gift that we have. Hey, no matter what we've done, no matter how far we've ran from God, he is there willing freely to give you forgiveness. And that forgiveness changes everything. It it, it can be the absolute difference maker in your life. We see this in Philemon verse 11. It says, formerly Onesimus was useless to you, But now he has become useful both to you and to me. And this is so cool. This is like a little Easter egg. This is a little nugget in our Bible that Paul's actually using a play on words because the name Onesimus literally means useful. That's cool. So he's saying, hey, he was useless. He wasn't living into his identity. Now he's useful. He's really living into it. And you look at that and like, oh, man, that's so cool. That like just really highlighted that whole verse. And that's cool for you, Pastor Joe, because you've gone to seminary. You've studied Greek. But there's no way somebody like me could get that same insight that you've got wrong. It's available to everybody because I'm going to show you how. That little nugget was a footnote 
in your Bible. So you open your Bible as you're reading. Maybe you see a, a little letter in parentheses or a letter in superscript. And you go down to the bottom of your page and you would find this. Onesimus means useful. You got the tools too, baby. It's just you got to get in God's word, okay? It's there for you. And we're going to walk you through how to study the Bible. But pay attention to the margins and the footnotes of cross-references and nuggets like that. By the way, if you do not have a paper Bible, uh, we have more here. We're giving them away. If you do not have a, a paper Bible, a hard copy Bible, we would love to give you one. One's uh, translations ESV, NIV, or NLT. There's descriptions of what those mean. Go back next uh, last week's message to learn more about those different translation meanings. But that's for you for free. Thank you for your generosity. You can pick one up. Guys, you can get your socks. You can be styling on your feet and a Bible as you walk out of here today. So that's good. So we get this understanding that Onesimus means useful. So forgiveness means you aren't branded to who you were, but that you have an opportunity to live out the identity God declares over your life. That's powerful. Step into the calling. Step into the identity. Step into the name God speaks over your life. But let's go back to verse 11 one more time. Because there's also this language I like of formerly and but now. Formerly you were useless, but now you're useful. The Greek words for formerly are pote. The Greek words for but now is denuni. The only reason I say that to you because those are cool sounding names. Pote and Danuni. Come on, you cannot have Danuni without the Pote, everybody. You can't have the but now without the formerly. And formerly, though we like to run from it, we don't like to talk about our past, the formerly is part of your story that through the power of God working in you becomes a but now moment. So we need that formerly. We, we thank God for that formerly that leads to but now. And I want to illustrate this, uh, this 30-second clip of a football play. Check it out. Hey, first off, dads, I got you today. All sports illustrations, I, I got you covered. Got the music going on that, gets you hyped. Man, this, I love this. It's a great example of formerly, but now. Let's go back and look at it frame for frame. That first moment, the guy muffs the punt. That's a live ball. And now, listen, he's not running forward in life. He's looking down. He's running backwards. He's scrambling trying to fix by himself the mistake he made. Where does that lead us? Well, the second frame, even though it's hard to see, well, he's surrounded by the opposing team. He's surrounded by guys deep in enemy territory. Guys are ready to knock him off his feet. That's formerly. That's the pote. But keep going. If we pick the ball up and we start taking steps forward, there's opportunity. Not only that, when you got some guys surrounding you, ready to run the race of life with you, ready to get your back, now things are starting to change. You go fast forward to another clip, and you see now these guys have been running with him for 80 yards down the field. So you go to the next frame, and you see, man, hey, you got some guys running with you. And if you notice number 21 there, He's been running with him from the beginning. He's running with him the whole way, knocking folks on their back. I mean, somebody who's just running through the ups and downs of life with you, who's willing to put the enemy on his back to help you get where you need to go. And then they get to that moment of celebration. Man, hey, we're cheering you on. We're celebrating you. They're not saying, hey, man, what a mistake you made back there. That was so goofy. No, they're celebrating Getting it right, moving forward. 
to a but now moment, a denuni moment. And you got to look at your life and you got to look at the, the mistakes that you've made and realize in the hands of God, they can actually be used for good. Ralph Waldo Emerson says it this way, men succeed when they realize that their failures are the preparation for their victories. God can use it. That's what Ralph says. This is what the Bible says, that the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. Seven in the Bible, it's a word of, of meaning and significance. It's a number that shows fullness or completion. So it's saying, hey, not only have you failed, you're a complete failure at this point. Seven times. And we look at that and we say, man, I feel like a complete failure. How could I ever be godly? How could I ever move forward? Listen, godliness is not about falling. You're going to fall. Godliness is about getting up again. That's what it's about. God has an incredible way of turning good things out of wrong turns. Uh, of still bringing his mission out of your mistakes. But you got to surrender. It's got to be a moment of saying, Lord, I need forgiveness. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all this mess so I can get back in the game, so I can move forward in the name, in the calling you have for me. God is still writing your story as I speak. Come on, maybe it's formerly I was sick, but by the power of God, I'm healed. Formerly, I was addicted, but now by the grace of God, I'm one day sober. I'm two days sober. I'm three days sober. Yeah. Formerly, I was overwhelmed with anxiousness, but now I have the peace of God in my life. Formerly, my marriage was hanging on by a thread, but now we're standing on a solid foundation Formerly, I was lost, but now I'm found. For some of you, your story changes today. I don't know how you walked in here. I don't know what the formerly is for you, but today can be a new day when you embrace the free gift of God's forgiveness. I don't know who needs it, but it's available for you today. Pick up the ball. Hey, don't you try to run by yourself either. You got to have some guys around you. Life groups just opened up. We need fathers and father figures. We need spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. And we need guys like number 21 who are willing to run with us through life. You need that. Don't try to do it on your own, but it's available to you. Your story changes today. Here's the third main character. It's Philemon. And this is when you are called to forgive someone. Not that you just need to forgive someone. Some of you are feeling that nudge right now. God's speaking to you to forgive. You're called to forgive them. I love how Paul frames it up for Philemon. He says, I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Paul considers forgiveness a gift. He considers it an act of generosity. He's saying, don't you forget about the grace you've received. Don't you forget about what Jesus has done in your life. Don't forget how good it is to be with Jesus now. Don't forget about your own formerly and your own but now story. There's always a good reason not to reconcile. Reconciliation is hard. Forgiveness is hard. But this is personal. This is a family matter. As we read in the introduction of Philemon, Paul addresses not only Philemon, but Philemon's wife, Philemon's son, and this household servant. This was a household matter. He's saying it's so important to learn to forgive because Paul wanted Philemon, and I want you to win at home to be successful at home, to be famous at home. You never want to be liked the most by people that know you the least. You want to win at home. He's saying you cannot do that 
without forgiveness. Psychologist Vern Bingston did an award-winning 35-year longitudinal study finding that 68% of children who have a close relationship with their father will hold on to their father's faith. Translation, you model the love of Jesus at home and it sticks with them. It changes your family. It changes the trajectory of your family. Paul said, don't miss this opportunity to win in your home. Show forgiveness. He doesn't stop there. As you read Philemon, you notice how Paul addresses Philemon. He says things like this in verse 1 and verse 17. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. This language of hospitality, of welcoming, of friendship. Again, Paul is using all of this as a play on words because Philemon, his name means to be a friend to, to welcome, to befriend. So he's saying, once again, calling out their identity, calling out who you are. You are a friend. You are someone with the gift of hospitality. So welcome this guy in. Paul's saying it it needs to be your go-to reaction. It needs to be your spiritual instinct to befriend others, to welcome others, to forgive others. This should be just your natural reflex. When God says it, you do it. When God has called you to do something, you, you step out in faith and you do it. Dads, I fully believe you're equipped for that challenge. Come on, everybody knows that dads have great reflexes. Come on, look at this clip. 15 seconds of just dad reflex montage. Go. Come on, with the baby in hand. Give it up for dads. Come on. Hey, guys, let's be quick to forgive, quick to reconcile, quick to welcome someone in, quick to speak life over them, quick to believe the best in others. It's your natural instinct. Oh, no, it's your supernatural instinct, something that Jesus wants to download in each of you. How can we do this? We're reminded what Jesus did for us. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Maybe you're called to forgive someone. Maybe you're called to initiate the process of reconciliation. You are called to win at home and make a difference in the sphere of influence God has entrusted you with. How will you respond today? Which of these three do you relate to most today? Who do you need to take a risk on? Who needs forgiveness? Who are you called to forgive? This is your opportunity to respond. Let me pray for you.